Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. This seems to be the call to worship used in the Davidic temple, and it's, I think, our most basic creed, the steadfast of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. This morning we gather just before our much-anticipated Thanksgiving break to give ourselves with gratitude to God, who in Christ has given us more than we can ask or imagine. We are welcome, whether in person or online. Today's chapel continues the fall series on the church and technology. Dr. Van Hooser brings a message. Dr. Donald and Mrs. Mary Guthrie lead us in prayer and scripture reading. Steve and Amy McCausland, Josh Lamb, and Kaz Okaya are our musicians leading us and prompting our musical worship. For students in the TEDS and graduate school, I want to reiterate the invitation to the TEDS and TGS students to join President and Mrs. Parent for a Christmas open house two weeks from today, from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Waybright Center. And now will you please stand, and we will read responsively from Psalm 95, uh, which is our call to worship. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Good morning. You 
the lilies with beauty and splendor how much more will he clothe you how much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow how much more does he love you how much more does he love you if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor how much more will he clothe you how much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow how much more does he love you how much more does he love you if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor how much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow? How much more does he love you? How much more, Jaira? You are known. You are Jaira. You are known. And I will be content in every circumstance. You are Jaira, you are no Jaira, you are Jaira, you are no, you are a Jaira, you are no, and I will be content. In every circumstance, you are a gyra, you are a nun. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have world. Give me Jesus. And when I am alone,
to die. And when I come to die, and when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You be seated. Good morning. I'll be reading some passages from Philippians and inviting us to pray, so let's pray together. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's lay our hearts open before the Lord that his spirit, by his spirit, we may discern what he's asking of us and what he's doing in us. Let us pray. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now hear these words that plow our hearts and let us confess our shortcomings to the Lord. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same is that of Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Work out your salvation then in fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let us pray for the church around the world, for our brothers and sisters who are physically suffering for his name and for those whose suffering is born in other ways as well. Let us ask Jesus in what ways he's calling us, personally and corporately, to press on for this prize of the high calling. Let us pray. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Turn to someone next to you or near you as you're able and pray about one thing about which you're anxious this week of gratitude. One thing which only Jesus can satisfy or accomplish for us. Pray yourself to the Lord or pray with someone nearby. Let us pray. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading for today is Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 25. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Ephesians 4, 11 through 25. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness." Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated.
This is an aerogram, a lightweight, lightweight piece of foldable paper that is simultaneously envelope, letter, and stamp. It is, to me, a special piece of communication technology because for nine months, it was the only means I had of connecting with the French Mademoiselle across the Atlantic, who would later become my wife. The aerogram was invented by the British Army during the Second World War to communicate with troops in the Middle East. The US adopted it in 1947, but then phased them out around 2006 because of email and so on. But for a phoneless couple prior to the internet era, they were a godsend. Aerogram, letters, grama, written into the air, arrow. Though they travel through the air, the aerogram is actually a slow medium of communication, which is fine because it kept us from having an argument. It's hard to argue when you have to wait 10 days to get a response. Fast forward to date night just a few years ago, a dinner at a local Libertyville restaurant, uh, the Main Street Social. As its name is, so it was. The place was packed with so many people speaking into the air that my wife and I could not hear one another across the table. So we had to text each other during the dinner to have a conversation. Well, these two vignettes show how communication technology is both medium and mold, a force that shapes the way persons relate. The inspiration for the title of my sermon comes from a book by John Durham Peters, Speaking into the Air, a history of the idea of communication. And my topic is communication technology and the church. Speaking into the air is arguably what ministers of the word do. Jesus taught with parables, but air was the medium of his communication too, open air, preaching to be exact. The same medium used by evangelicals like George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, and Billy Sunday. To preach is to speak into the air, or if you're Billy Graham, across the airwaves. Here's how Augustine describes communication. He says, when there is an idea in your heart, it clothes itself in sound, somehow gets itself into this vehicle, travels through the air, comes to me, through my ear has your thought descended into my heart. Today, of course, we have multiple ways of communicating ideas, email, Zoom, online education. What should we think of these newer forms of communicative technology? Should churches charged with ministering God's word use any and all means so long as they propel our speaking faster and further into the air? Well, I want to begin with some thoughts about what communication is, then a brief history of communications technology, and then we'll look at some challenges they pose to the church, and then we'll get to Ephesians 4 and see what Paul has to say about speaking into the air. So first, what is communication? Basically, it's the exchange of information between two or more agents, social interaction through messages. One school of thought focuses on the transmitting and processing of information, call it the messaging model. This view sees communication as a kind of transaction. A second school focuses on the way meaning is socially constructed giving communicants a shared sense of reality, call it the world-making model. And this view sees communication as a kind of interaction that helps hold a community together. Both models have something to contribute to those of us who want to speak the truth in love. Content matters, to be sure, yet the way it gets transmitted matters as well. For communication is the process in which relationships are established, maintained, 
modified, or sometimes terminated. We do this through exchanging messages. So whichever definition or model you prefer, I think you'll agree that communication is key to relationships, that relationships sometimes suffer due to poor communication, and that communication sometimes breaks down. Aristotle may have described humans as the speaking animal, but humans are hardwired by the privacy of their experience to have communication problems. So, can communication technology help? And to answer this, it may help to consider the history of its effects. We can organize the history of this technology with what I call the six days of communication, where each day represents an age. That is, a period of time dominated by a particular communication technology. The first day of communication is the oral, face-to-face -face communication. We see this in the Bible as early as Genesis 2. And oral cultures still exist. The Peruvian novelist Mario Vargas Llosa, his book The Storyteller, is all about an Amazonian tribe that maintains its memory and identity by gathering periodically to hear tales that represent them and their history. The second day of communication is writing. And the manuscript era dates from biblical times to just before the Reformation. Letters from kings play a major role in the plot of Ezra and Nehemiah. And of course, you know the New Testament is filled with letters from Peter and Paul and others. In his seminal work, Orality and Literacy, the Jesuit scholar Walter Ong argues that new communication technology affects not simply how we transmit messages, but how we process experience. Quote, technologies are not mere exterior aids, but also interior transformations of consciousness, end quote. For example, writing is very useful. It preserves information, but some think it also weakens the memory. But in an oral culture, you know only what you remember. Well, the revolutionary nature of new technology comes into view with the third day of communication, the print era. Inaugurated by the Gutenberg printing press, this allowed Luther not only to out-narrate, but to out-publish his Catholic opposition. As Elizabeth Edwards argues in her book, the printing press as an agent of change communications and cultural transformations in early modern Europe. Moving on, the fourth and fifth days of communication are the electric and electronic, respectively. The former encompassing inventions like the telegraph and phonograph, and the latter audiovisual media like radio, television, and video. Theodore Epp launched his Back to the Bible radio program in 1939, and evangelicals have not been simply speaking, but broadcasting into the air for decades. Uh, Pat Robertson established the Christian Broadcasting Network in 1960, and only this year stepped down as host of its flagship program, the 700 Club. So many of these earlier communication technologies still exist. We still have books, radio, maybe not cassettes and eight-track tapes. But many think the internet marks the end of the analog age. Welcome to the digital century, the sixth day of communication, our present. Don't look now, but a seventh day is coming and it probably will not be a day of communication rest. Indeed, one striking lesson to take away from this very brief history has to do with the accelerated rate of change in communication technology. The revolutions are coming faster and faster because it, it took centuries to get from oral to writing and writing to the printing press, but just another 400 years to the telegraph, and then only a few more decades to the television, and so on. The days are growing shorter. Apple launches something new every year, so 
we'll need to keep all our wits about us in order to navigate the digital rapids ahead. Remember Ong's thesis, changes in communication technology are transformative. He says, printing liberated humanity, but also triggered centuries of religious strife. Visual communication deepened human empathy, but diluted public discourse. Electronic communication engaged the world's nervous system, but submerged unique cultures. And now, the digital revolution seems to be undermining the literate cultures that were created by the printing press. According to one study, the average American's information consumption has more than tripled since 1980. If you're an average American, apparently, you spent about 70% of your waking hours in 2009 consuming information. You consumed, each person, about 33.8 gigabytes of data, over 100,000 words. Now, one commentator says that much of our daily communication consists of junk messaging, <laughs> the informational equivalent of junk food. The idea that we are becoming less and less literate does not bode well for those of us who aspire rightly to handle the word of truth and then to speak it. But here's the point. Social media socializes. It trains individuals and communities to communicate in certain ways. It forms us into being certain kinds of communicators. If communication technologies are not neutral tools, but tools that shape those who use them, then it behooves church leaders to take stock of how these technologies may inadvertently be affecting us and our ministry of the word. I know it's tempting to use every new technology that comes along in the hope that it will speed our ministry of the gospel, the way the printing press helped Luther. But we have to ask, is it wise for members of a holy nation to want to be like the other digital nations? In preparing this sermon, I was surprised to come across an essay in the International Journal of Information and Communication Technology Research, an essay by a Muslim scholar. And in this essay, he fervently advocates using all kinds of communication technology in order to promote Islam. He begins by noting how secular forces are so powerful in shaping lifestyles and promoting worldviews. And then he wonders, why should infidels have all the good technologies? So to communicate on this sixth day is to enter into a competitive arena filled with bots jockeying to get your attention marketing to the left of them, marketing to the right of them, into the jaws of Zuckerberg, into the gate of gates, rode the 144,000. T.S. Eliot's lines continue to haunt. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And we might add, where is the community we have lost in information technology? Given the accelerating rate of revolutions in communication technology, the church has had less and less time to reflect on what they're doing to us. That's why we're focusing on the church and technology in this semester chapel series. And in recent weeks, Christina Bieber Lake has called our attention to the way in which technology subverts our capacity to pay deep attention to reality, resulting in shallow thinking and shallow living. And then David Louie reminded us that smartphones are not conducive to slow spirituality. My question this morning concerns the role of communication technology in the church. The church is a creature of the word, as Luther put it. And so I'm interested both in the message we communicate, but also the nature of our social interaction as we do so. Mind you, if Marshall McLuhan is correct, the medium is the message, and we should not separate too sharply the message that we send from the nature of our social interaction in sending it. 
I think there's more than a linguistic similarity between communication and community, because both have to do with making common, or what we have in common, including our collective sense of reality. When churches use new communication technologies to promote worship, witness, and education, what exactly are they communicating? What kind of communities are they forming and becoming? According to Quentin Schultz, a professor of communication arts and science at Calvin College, the most important question we should be asking is whether our cyber practices are making us better persons and our society more civil. He goes on, unless we focus as much on the quality of our character as we do on technological innovation, potentially good informational techniques will ultimately reduce our capacity to love one another. Indeed, and this brings us back to Ephesians 4 and Paul's mention of speaking the truth in love. The Bible is clearly in favor of communication. Jonathan Edwards says God is a communicative being who wants to share or make common his own goodness. And God uses diverse creaturely media, clouds, fires, even human language to make common his own knowledge of himself, to reveal himself to us. Andrew Byers calls all these means theomedia, theomedia. But I submit that the supreme instance of God's personal communication is also the most astonishing example of communication technology we can think of, the incarnation, the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ, the God-man, is the communication of divinity in the medium of humanity. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.11 that this same risen Christ gives further communication gifts in the person of apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers, ministers of the word whose distinct ministries all aim to equip the saints for service. What kind of service? More ministry of the word. Not necessarily preaching, but building up the body of Christ through everyday forms of discourse. Martin Luther spoke of the priesthood of all believers to indicate that all Christians have the privilege and responsibility of ministering the word to one another in hymns, spiritual songs, wise counsel, whispered encouragements, and why not? Text messages over the table or across the room. Nothing beats interpersonal verbal communication for fostering maturity in Christ. Walter Ong says that sound, the result of our speaking into the air, sound unites human beings more than any other medium you see, speaking invites another person into our space to exist with us, to associate with us in real time. Sound binds our interiors. By way of contrast, the more technological our communication becomes, the more it's like transferring information rather than participating in community. In talk, you interact with another human being. With other forms of communication technology, you interact with a web page, maybe Siri. Paul, of course, had no inkling of the digital age to come. Yet I think he would agree with Quentin Schultz, who says, 500 channel digital television systems are great for delivering specialized programming to audiences. But they'll never promote the forms of discourse that nurture virtuous character and build moral communities. And nurturing communities is precisely what Paul has in mind here when in verse 15 he mentions speaking the truth in love. 
In his commentary on this passage, uh, our friend and colleague, the late Grant Osborne, calls speaking the truth in love the formula for producing mature Christians. The formula for producing mature Christians. The verb, aletheo, can mean both speaking or doing the truth, but in the context of not being blown about by every wind of doctrine, the emphasis is clearly on sound teaching. I like what Augustine says. It's the sign of good minds, he writes, to love the truth within the words rather than the words themselves. But transmitting information, even if it's true, is not enough. Paul says we're to speak the truth in agape, in love. Too many new communication technologies seem to be better at tearing down rather than building up our neighbors. We've actually had to invent new terms like flaming, trolling, and cyberbullying to describe abusive online behavior. This is not the way you learned Christ. To speak in love is to speak in ways that foster understanding and unity. And that rules out all deceptive means and manipulative means of communication. The point is not to get more likes on your Facebook page, but to build up love in the body of Christ. Indeed, Paul's big idea here in Ephesians 4 is that Christ's gifting of the church should bring about unifying, truth-telling lives of edification and love. Does this mean that new life in Christ requires old-style communication technology? Well, listen to what Paul says in verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Friends, speaking the truth to one another in love is essential to living a life worthy of the gospel, to practicing the new humanity we have in Christ. Paul in this verse is citing Zechariah 8.16, where Zechariah says, speak the truth to one another. And the context of Zechariah indicates that the neighbors in question are fellow covenant members. But as many commentators on the Ephesians passage are quick to note, this doesn't imply that Christians are free to lie to their non-Christian neighbors. It simply reminds us that Paul is talking about the importance of truthfulness as an aspect and requirement of genuine community. Jesus' favorite mode of public communication, as you know, was the parable. But speaking the truth in love is one way for the church to be a living parable of the kingdom. I think it's a stunning image that people of God as communicative medium, as a means of communicating the gospel of God, the body of Christ as body language. We can go further. The church's teaching, worship, and evangelism more or less corresponds to Cicero's three purposes of public communication, which Augustine adopts and about which he says, to teach is a necessity, to delight is a beauty, to persuade is a triumph. So think of the church, the people of God in a particular place, as itself, if not quite a piece of communication technology, then at least as a communicating community. Again, Quentin Schultz says that real community is marked by lay participation over expert control, geographic proximity instead of disembodied messaging, neighborliness over bureaucratic authority, and cross-generational continuity instead of intragenerational myopia. I'm struck by how Paul's vision of the local church meets all these criteria. And my prayer for local churches, especially today in our polarized times, 
is that they will indeed be real communities, able to reason together, speaking the truth in love, and in all they're communicating, communicating Christ. Now, speaking into the air without living it out on the ground in local community may result in communicating only a half-truth. The church isn't simply a herald of the gospel, a means of production. The church is part of the message itself and a means of its representation. Simply by being itself, the people of God, the body of Christ, the fellowship of the Spirit, simply by being itself, the church communicates gospel truth. The church's ministry of the word, then, is not an obsolete communication technology. It's rather God's chosen medium to communicate the power of the gospel, the power of God to salvation. The medium a reconciled community, a medium is the message. And Paul says as much to the Corinthians. He says, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts. Church members are not arrow, but pneumograms. When it comes to communication technology, speaking the truth in love is the Christian's prime directive. Remember, to communicate means to make common, to share something of oneself, if only a piece of information. And we succeed in making common when we foster communion, a deep sharing. And this is where I want to conclude our reflections as well. You know you've communicated successfully when you're able to coordinate your behavior with others. And what we're trying to learn together here at Trinity as a community is Christ. It's the mind of Christ we're trying to share. And one way to do it is by sharing his body, the body of Christ. That's a truth spoken into the air, but it doesn't simply dissolve into the atmosphere. The body of Christ, that states a truth but also through the power of the Spirit, it brings something new into being. Sharing the Lord's Supper is a prime example of how the church serves as a medium for communicating the gospel. For as, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We communicate the gospel when we demonstrate communion with God and with one another. To view communication with Shakespeare as simply the marriage of two minds is to underestimate the importance of the body. Professions of love are one thing, but a lifetime of fidelity quite another. The only refuge we have against communication fraud is the propaganda of the deed. Do this in remembrance of me. The fullness of what we do in the Lord's Supper, sharing his body and blood, can only be done in person with speech acts and embodied action. So we have to resist the hostility for the organic that characterizes some high-tech communication snobs. As a, nat as a native Californian, I enjoy body surfing, but disembodied net surfing transforms some people into digital nomads lost in the metaverse. In sharp contrast, celebrating the Lord's Supper roots individuals into the larger body of Christ, the communion of saints. The ministry of the word, the celebration of the sacraments, these, I suggest, are the communication technologies that speak the truth and do the truth we speak in love. These are the communicative practices that foster rich communion, making common, making the many one in Christ. 
So as we think about new communication technologies, we must make sure that they serve rather than subvert the ministry of the word. Don't worry about keeping up with the latest technology in order to be relevant. There is an irrelevance worse than the failure to be trendy. It's the failure to be relevant to God and to his communicative activity in the church. The church then, going about its daily life, singing spiritual songs, speaking the truth in love, passing the bread and the wine, these things remain the most effective technologies for building up the body. There is no better way to communicate the new reality that is in Christ. Amen. Would you stand and let's respond in song? doxology to benediction. 
gifted members of the body of Christ, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Go in kindness and compassion to love and serve the Lord and one another. Amen.